The title of this message again is, is Go Fish. And I want to read the scripture that we're going to found this message around that we as the body of Christ have something that is so great that we can't contain and we have to share it with the world. And so let's start with Matthew 4, 18 through 25. It says, walking along the beach of Lake Galilee, Jesus saw two brothers, Simon and Andrew. They were fishing, throwing their nets into the lake. It was their regular work. Jesus said to them, come with me. I will make you a new kind of fisherman and I'll show you how to catch men and women instead of perch and bass. They didn't ask questions, but simply dropped their nets and followed again. The title of today's message is Go Fish. And if you notice in the text that I just wrote, he said, come and be with me. If we're going to fish, we have to first behold the living Christ. And as we behold him, then it said that he will make them. He was going to make them a new kind of fisherman. So as we behold him, as we go with him, as we're with him, we behold the Christ who actually makes us into something. We become something so that we will go fish. And so it's a three-part process that you need to know as a missionary, as someone who's following Christ, as a believer. Our job is to advance the kingdom. And if we don't like what's happening in the world, then the enemy actually works through people. And guess what? The way that Jesus works on planet Earth today, we can cry out to him all day long. God, will you do this? Will you change this? God, do you see this or that social justice issue? And And actually, as we cry out to him, he's looking back at us and he's saying, I've done everything that I needed to do. Actually, it's your job. Tag, you're it. You go fish. And so this three-step process is that we behold, we become, and then we go fish. Have you ever played the game Go Fish? And how you play the game is that if I, a card holder, am holding cards and I need another particular card, then I pick someone and I ask them if they're holding that card that I need. And if they don't have that card, then they say, go fish. Well, I want to translate this game into your everyday life. Let's imagine that you go into every environment and the people that you interact with, you ask them, not in words, so to speak, but you get to know them and you're interacting with them and you're looking for if they have Christ inside of them. And if they don't, if you notice that they don't know him, that they're not following him, that they're not pursuing our savior, that they're not on fire and in love with him, then it's your clue and your indication that you need to go fish, that you ask him for strategies to to be the bridge between him and them, that your job is simply to go fish in every environment that you go into. And and I want to think about this this saying, it really penetrated my heart. I heard this and, and it's a saying by Charles Spurgeon. And he says, that if you are not a missionary, then you're an imposter. And so if we think about this statement, it has grave implications that if Christ lives inside of me, then I naturally will advance the gospel of the kingdom. I naturally will minister to those who are in need. I naturally will want to share him with others. I'll pray for the sick. I'll drive out darkness. That's what my job is, that I'm on mission and I may not be in vocational ministry, but my mission everywhere that I go, every minute of every day is to advance the gospel of the, of the kingdom and to make him famous. And so in America, we've had, uh, we've had this thing that's really hindered or, or handicapped the body of Christ. We think about, well, if I know someone and they don't know Jesus, then what I can do is maybe I can invite them to come to church. And if the churches will just have good programs or good things or, or good this or that, then maybe they'll want to go. They'll be enticed enough to go. And if they go to church, then the people at the church, the pastor at the church, they can lead them to Christ, that they'll hear the message. And so, so at best, that's what we've done. But 
The issue is that even prior to COVID, that over half of the people in our culture today weren't interested in going to church. They didn't drive by the churches and wonder what was happening inside of the church. They don't have a crisis in their life and say, gosh, I need to go to church so that this crisis can be resolved. In fact, it was quite the opposite. And now think about this with me, with the COVID and with with the things that are happening in society, there's even a less likely chance that people will come into the church. We as the body of Christ have to go out. And whether or not we do this, whether or not we fish, if we don't go fish, there will actually be consequences for eternity. People will not hear about the good news of Christ. People will not be discipled. And these are the things that we're commanded to do. Whether we know it or like it or not, we as a body of Christ have been passed the baton and we're accountable and responsible for the gospel in our nation, in our circle of influence every day. And we have to be aware of that. And so deep down inside, if we know Jesus... And as we're following Jesus, we want to make him known. He's too great for us just to selfishly contain. People need to know if we're on fire for him, people need to be alive in him. And we want to share the best thing with them that we possibly can. And if we believe the word of God is true, that if people don't go to God through Jesus Christ, they will spend eternity in hell. So there's grave implications for us if we don't advance the gospel. And so many of us would say, I want to, but I don't know how. But yet then we're commanded to go into the world and to preach the good news and to lay our hands on the sick and to drive out demons. We're commanded to make disciples. That's our purpose. We're commanded to do these things. But yet we say, well, I don't know what my purpose is. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Well, if you cut hair, then you cut hair for the advancement of the gospel of the kingdom. If you pull teeth, if you're a dentist, then you you do dentistry for the advancement of the gospel of the kingdom. I'm a trauma therapist and I know that I am supposed to utilize what I know about the brain so that people will be set free from complex trauma and mental health issues for the advancement of the gospel of the kingdom. If you're a mom, then you are a mother for the advancement of the gospel of the kingdom. We are on mission to make disciples, to preach the good news, to lay our hands on the sick and to drive out darkness. And so there's really no excuses. But as we start to bring that word up, that evangelism word, we've all been exposed to televangelists and evangelism, and we've all had that knock on our door. And we have this fear and visions of door knocking to advance the gospel of the kingdom, but that's not what it looks like at all. And so today, again, as we're learning how to go fish, we have to behold him and then we become, and then as we behold and we become, then we go and we advance the gospel of the kingdom. We go and fish. And so I want to talk to you just a second. Uh, 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 about the book of Ecclesiastes. This is one of my favorite books. I always gravitate back towards this. And so the context is David, King David's son, his name was Solomon, and he ultimately became king and he's going to rebuild the temple. And, and King Solomon asked for wisdom. He was the wisest man on earth. And he was living in a time where there wasn't strife. There wasn't political uh, unrest. There wasn't war. And he had absolutely everything at his fingertips, whether it was uh, financial things, political things, leisure things. It, It was all available to him. He could explore everything and anything. And in the midst of life, having everything that he possibly could desire, he said this, he said that life is vanity. That was his conclusion, that there's nothing new under the sun, that you'll come and you'll go. And and there's really nothing new that you or I could do. Think about this with me. Do you know your great, great, great grandmother? I have no idea who mine is, or my great, great grandmother, or my great, great grandmother, or my great grandmother. I know my grandmother and I know my mom, but 
but my great, great grandmother, her life has come and it's gone. And did she make an impact? I have no idea. I don't even know who she was. And so life is just a vapor. And so how do we actually make an impact? We were born We go through the stages in America, we're born, and then we go through education, and then ultimately, uh, do we get married? Do we get a job? Do we have kids? What do we do to succeed? And then we want to retire, and then ultimately we die. There's nothing new under the sun. And this is what King Solomon was saying. And in fact, the Population Reference Bureau uh, has the statistics that more than 108 billion people have been born. Have you ever thought about this? That the current global population right now today is about 7.5 billion people. That means that you and I and everyone who is currently alive on planet Earth, we represent about 7% of the total number of humans who have ever lived. 7%. So what about the other ones? And is there anything that I can do significantly to advance the gospel of the kingdom, to make a difference? Because if I live for the American dream, then I want the next latest, greatest. I want the degrees. I want the vehicles. I want the ideal house. I want the ideal husband. I want the 2.5 children. I want a dog or a cat. I want a good vocation. I want to eventually retire. And until what? Everything, when we die, everything that are, that's the material things that we've accumulated in our life, we don't take with us. And so how are we going to actually make a lifetime of difference in the lives of others so that we'll be remembered and we'll actually make a difference for eternity? That's how we need to be thinking. And the only way that we can do that is if we go fish, if we have a kingdom perspective, if we know what we're supposed to do. So King Solomon, as he goes through all of this, there's a time for this and there's a time for that and everything is vanity and hard things happen. Bad things happen to the good people and bad things happen to the bad people. And we live and then we die and nobody remembers. At the end of all of this, he said something very, very interesting. He said, the last and final word is this. Now, let me ask you this. If the, if the wisest person on the, on the planet says the last and final word is this, if this is the inspired word of God, and this is something that we need to take seriously. So he said really two things. The last and final word is this. Fear God and do what he tells you to do. That's what we need to do. And that's what we'll be accountable for. And so the fear of the Lord is actually the godly pressure to do what he's asked us to do. And as we're obedient to him, how I measure success is that I'm obedient to him. And if if for some reason I say, well, you know, he's not talking to me. I had somebody the other day say, you know, I just don't hear what he's saying. He's just not talking anymore. And I said, well, have you done the last thing that you think that he told you to do? And they said, well, no. And I said, well, why would he say anything else to you? And so we want to fear the Lord with the godly pressure to do what he says to do. And then we want to do it. We want to be obedient to him. And I want you to remember this. These, this is the, the kind of the, the word that I want you to remember. It's JIC. J-I-C. How could you be joyfully, immediately, and completely obedient to what God tells you to do? And so I want to come alongside of you so that you can JIC so that you can be joyfully, immediately, and completely obedient to what God has told you to do. And if you're a Christian, when you asked Jesus to come into your heart, when you said that you'll give your life for him, that you'll have a relationship with him, that you just didn't accept him just to be a cultural Christian, you actually accepted him to follow him and to not make him look like you and to have your political views and to act like you do and just invite him to just come along alongside you as you continue with business as usual so that you'll be saved from hell and have your fire insurance, but actually you accepted him to die to yourself. And as you die to yourself, you have just automatically been put in a battle that you may or may not be aware of. And that battle is for souls. And so I want to guide you so that you'll be able to be joyfully, immediately, and completely obedient to do what God's called you to do. And that's to make disciples and to go fish. And so in this process, again, 
There's a three-step process that you have to behold him. He said, come and follow me. Behold him. Be with him. And then you have to become him. I will make you. And then you have to go fish. And so that's the process. That's what I'm talking to you about today. Behold, become, go fish. Repeat. Behold, become, go fish. Go fish. Repeat. That's your process. So let's go to another scripture. Mark 3, 14 through 15 says, He appointed 12 that they might, here it is, be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. And so he called them to be with him. Behold, be with. Power to do, power to fish comes from power to be, beholding and becoming. And so let's just imagine that it's pitch black, it's night, that you wake up in your room, there's absolutely no light, and you wonder what time it is. And so maybe you have one of those watches that when it's dark, it glows in the dark. And so have you ever thought about this? Why does it glow in the dark? Your watch, the face on your watch will light up and it will glow in the dark because it's connected to a battery and the, the ones that glow in the dark with the face are actually exposed to light during the day so that they have the power at night to be illuminated. And so if you're going to be, if you're going to have power, then you're going to have to be connected to a source. You're going to have to be connected to the light so that when you go into the darkness, you will be illuminated. Or let's just imagine you don't have on a watch or you don't sleep in your watch and you're wondering what time it is. Well, there it is. There's your, your plug-in alarm clock. And the reason why the alarm clock is illuminated is because it's plugged into the source of electricity. If you unplugged it, you would not be able to see what time it was. And the reason why it's illuminated, again, is because it's plugged in. You, in order to be illuminated, have to be plugged into the source. You behold, and then you become, and then you go fish. You will have no power without the source. And so you may be thinking, okay, so I'm plugged into the source, but what about these sins? What about this thing in my life that's not right. King Solomon, again, said, it's going to rain on the just and the unjust. Bad things really happen to good people. You may be going through it financially or physically or emotionally or somebody that you love or care about is having a horrible time. And so what about the sins? What about the things in our culture? What about the problems or the failures or the struggles? Do you know that the Bible says actually seek first the kingdom and then everything else will be added, that we have to seek him. We have to, again, we have to behold him and you can't behold him and then look at your problems. You can't behold him and then feel sorry for yourself. You can't behold him and be self-absorbed. You have to behold him. I heard this analogy the other day and I think it's actually brilliant as I know about the brain is if I'm beholding him, then again, I can't think about anything else. And so think about an empty cup. Imagine that you had an empty cup. And I want to ask you, if your assignment was to get the air out of that cup, how would you do that? Well, the way that you get the air out of the cup is you actually would pour water into it and the water would replace the air. And I want you to think about this with me, that you have the power of the Holy Spirit living inside of you. If you're a believer and a follower of Christ, that's who I'm talking to today. And you're supposed to advance the gospel of the kingdom. And the, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead actually lives inside of you. And you focus on that, that you've got that, that power, that water, the Holy Spirit living inside of you. And that takes care of all of the air. And so that's your strategy is that you have to behold him. And as you behold him, you become like him. And as you become like him, then he gives you the power to do what you're called to do. Let's go to another scripture, Luke 9, 1 through 2. When Jesus had called the 12 together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. So listen to this. After they were with him, as they beholded him and they became him, then he gave him power to go and to fish. And when they were fishing, these, this is the thing that they were fishing for. He said they gave him 
that he gave them power and authority to drive out demons, to cure diseases, and to proclaim the kingdom. So they're preaching the gospel. They're connecting with people and they are connecting with their spirit man as their spirit man is, is woken up to a savior. They're, they're healing the sick. They're ministering to their physical bodies and they're caring for their soul. As they're driving out demons, their mind and their will and their emotions that are often tormented by demons. So we're supposed to help people in body and in soul and in spirit. That's what our job is. Every environment that we are going into, we are going to fish and we are ministering to people in a spiritual, in a body and in a soul level so that they can be transformed and become a follower of Jesus. Isn't this beautiful? And here's what I want to talk to you about just for a second. That power without the Prince of Peace is absolute poison. So we have to be with him. We have to behold him. We have to become like him. And then we will walk in power that will actually be living water for the dry and weary places in our nation. Imagine the difference that our nation would make is if all of us, the body of Christ did this in every arena where we needed to be fishing with social justice issues such as prostitution or human trafficking or child hunger or the foster care system or the criminal justice system. Imagine if we beheld the Christ, if we became like him, and if we went fishing to minister to people's spirits, souls, and bodies, imagine what it would look like in just a short period of time. And so as we're thinking about fishing, I want to, I want to give you real practical things that you can do, real practical strategies. And that strategy, I promise you, will not be door knocking, random door knocking. And so, so rest assured, but there are three truths before we get into the practical strategies that I want to just talk to you about for a minute. And the first truth is, is that before COVID, before the global pandemic in America, over half of the American populations never planned on stepping into church. Our strategy is that we have to get out. It's time for the church to leave the building. And the places that we need to go, it's not an event. It's not a mission trip that starts and stops. It's a continual mission that we were on in every environment that we go into for the rest of our lives. And so if you think about this with me, when Jesus ascended, Jesus was crucified, buried, resurrected, hung out with the disciples for 40 days, and then ascended into heaven. When he ascended, he said, all power and authority has been given to me. You will receive power and authority. And then you're supposed to go locally, nationally, and globally into the ends of the earth to make me famous among the nations. And so he could have just sucked up the body of Christ with him and he could have taken care of that himself, but he didn't. He said, it's going to be up to you. I've done my part and now it's time for you to do your part. He left us on mission. And since then, from generation to generation, the baton has been passed down. And the only way that our life cannot be vanity is if we make an eternal impact and we win souls and we make disciples. And so the second truth that we need to look at is that, you know, there's a lot of talk about what's happened in Europe and is, is Europe post Christian? Is it a post Christian era and is America following along? And, and so that question uh, just continually resounds in in my thoughts. And so is it a post-Christian era or could I present to you that it's a pre-Christian era for America, depending upon whether you and I decide to behold, become, and go fish. And so let me, let me unpack this just a little bit. So I am five foot six inches. And so by American standards, I'm not tall and I'm not short. What if I would tell you that I'm pre-tall or I'm pre-short. Well, 
again, I'm five foot six. I've never been tall and I've never been short. I'm just average by American standards. And so for me to say I'm pre-tall or pre-short is absolutely absurd. I'm average. When I order jeans, I, I, I order that not the short or the long, but the average. Think about this with me. If we think about the state of America in the 50s and the 80s and the 90s, as we entered into the year 2000, over the last 20 years, were people really following Christ? Or is it a cultural Christian society? And I want to present to you that a lot of people that I've met think that they're Christians, but they weren't any more following Christ than the man on the moon. And they added Jesus to them. They didn't die. The scriptures say that it's no longer me, but the spirit within because I've been crucified with Christ. They didn't die to their flesh. They didn't die to their sins. They made Jesus look like them and Jesus was convenient if they needed something from him, but it wasn't a relationship. They didn't behold him. They didn't become like him. There were the same statistics in the church as outside of the church. And so let me read to you this quote by a Danish theologian. He was actually born in 1813. And way back then, this is what he said. He said, a nominal civil form of Christianity is the greatest apostasy in which pagans live thinking they are Christians. And so right now, under the pressure in America with the things that are happening in our society, we need as Christians to go out and minister the gospel to those who may profess to be Christians. They're cultural Christians, but they're no, no more following Jesus than the, than the person who would admit to being the greatest sinner and the agnostic or the atheist. And so we've got to go fish. There's no getting around this. For the sake of eternity, for the sake of our loved ones, for the sake of our neighbor, for the sake of the person that we're looking into their eyes on a daily basis because of our sphere of influence or the places that we go, for the sake of that, if they don't know Christ, if they don't come to God through Jesus, nobody goes to God the Father except through Jesus for the sake of those who think they're Christian because they said the sinner's prayer, but they don't have a relationship with him, they're going to spend it eternity in hell, and it's time for us to do something about it. And then finally, the third truth, before we get into the practical applications of fishing. In the book that's entitled, In the Day That America Told the Truth, Americans ranked televangelists third from the bottom in integrity and honesty. Listen to this. Lower than lawyers, car salesmen, and prostitutes. The only two lower were drug dealers and organized crime members. So televangelism and evangelism has gotten a bad rap. There's got to be a way to do this where we're not compromising our integrity. There's got to be a way to do this where we don't get pushed back from a society. There's got to be a way for us to be evangelists and advance the gospel of the kingdom because we're commanded to do that, to make disciples and to go into the world and minister to people's bodies, souls, and spirits. There's got to be an appropriate way to do that. And what we've seen is in our culture, so many have misappropriately done that, that it's given it a bad Bad rap and it's produced guilt and it's produced fear in the body of Christ, in the true believers. I'm afraid to go and to share my faith. I'm afraid that I don't know enough. I'm afraid of the questions that they will ask me. I'm afraid that they'll They'll think I'm weird and I'll be ostracized or I feel guilty that I didn't. I feel guilty that I didn't pray. I feel, but I don't know how or I'm afraid to. So guilt and fear are, are, are surrounding the body of Christ so that we are immobilized with the thing that Jesus has asked us to do. So there's got to be a better way. And so I want to give you that practical way today. And I want to start by talking about what the Apostle Paul said. He has a model for us. And so if you will, 
I'm going to read from the Message Bible. If you will, I want you to highlight this scripture and reflect on the scripture for this next week. It's 1 Corinthians 9, 19 through 23. It says, even though I'm free from the demands and expectations of everyone, I have voluntarily become a servant to any and all in order to reach a wide range of people, religious, non-religious, meticulous, moralist, loose living, immoralist, the defeated, the demoralized, whoever. I didn't take on their way of life. I kept my bearings in Christ, but I entered their world and I tried to experience things from their point of view. I become just about every sort of servant there is in my attempts to lead those I meet into a God saved life. I did all of this because of the message. I didn't just want to talk about it. I wanted to be in on it. And so if Paul could do it, we can do it. He talked about the immoralist. Do you, you think about the worst case scenario that you would have to advance the gospel or evangelize in, and Paul did it. There is a way, there is a strategy, and our world has twisted that, and we have fear and we have guilt. But I want to tell you today that as I give you these practical steps, you're going to be able to go fish in every environment that you're in from here on out if you just so choose to do so. Do you know that hell was never intended for humans? That God gave everything to keep people from hell and spend an eternity in hell? That people literally have to step over Jesus to go to hell. And so my job and your job is to make him known. And if we don't, how will they know? If we don't do this, how, how will this happen? All right, so here's the meat of what I want to tell you. Here are the practical fishing strategies. And I want you to start to think about this with me. You don't have to go to Africa. And depending upon when you're watching this, we may or may not be on travel restrictions. You don't have to come with me and work with women who are being trafficked or prostituted or or go on homeless outreach. Here's where I need you to go. I need you to go where you go anyway. I need you to go into your regular environment and you to go fish and to ask the people if they know Christ. But you don't even have to come out and ask them if they know Christ. Here's what I want you to do. The first strategy is, is that I want you to start to walk slowly among the crowd and pay attention. And as you walk slowly among the crowd, I want you to add value to them and expect nothing in return. I want you to connect I want you to love. I want you to care. I want you to listen. I want you to be fully alive and fully available in every environment that you go into so that you're really, truly connecting with someone. That's it. I want you to establish a relationship. And and I want you to think about they won't know or they won't care what you know, but they'll care about how you make them feel. So what's it like to be on the other side of you? Can you walk slowly among the crowd? Can you connect with people? Can you make them feel loved? That's what I want you to do. I didn't say anything about mentioning Jesus or or, or praying for them or laying hands on them or casting out or any of that. I just want you to be fully alive, fully connected, fully available in the environments that you go into every day and ask yourself, how could I add value to this person? How could I minister to this person? How could I be Jesus without even mentioning Jesus? That's your first step. And then the second step is, is that I want you to connect with people through common ground. Paul talked about being around the immoralist. He talked about being around the greatest of sinners. And he kept his integrity. He didn't become a sinner to minister to the sinner. He didn't go and drink alcohol to minister to the alcoholic. So how could you connect through a common ground? And so let's imagine this person and 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 they're they're the furthest thing from you. They're doing things that you think are absolutely deplorable. That it doesn't look like you have anything in common with them. And what I want you to do is I don't want you to focus on the 99% of things that you don't have in common with them, but I want you to try to find the 1% that you can connect with them on, that you can find common ground, that you can 
establish a transformational relationship with them. People need relationships. People aren't objects. People aren't projects. People aren't broken and they don't need fixed. They need connection. They need to know that we have something that they don't have, that we could love them without an agenda and expect nothing in return and be connected with them. And then finally, the last thing that I want you to do, again, these are your practical evangelism strategies. I want you to pray before and during and after, not out loud, but I want you to be so cognizant and ask Jesus what he's already doing. The Bible talks about that Jesus put eternity in the hearts of all men. Remember that hell was never, ever meant for humans. That eternity is in their heart, that it is more natural for them to follow Christ and be connected with their creator than it is not. And the enemy has deceived them. And if we start to pray, then God, you connect me with people that I could walk slowly among and hear you in what you're doing and add value to them and love love them without an agenda and speak into their lives where they'll wonder what is it inside of me that is actually attractive? Why would I do that? Why would I help them? And that will turn everything around. And if you decide that you want to go and minister to the homeless or to the trafficked or to the prostituted or to the at-risk kids, then that's That's a great thing to do in addition to, but your mission field, your assignment is everywhere that your feet go every single day. You don't clock in and out of missions. Remember, if we're not, as a Christian, if we're not a missionary, then could we possibly be an imposter? It's more natural for you to love people and to connect with people and to minister to their body, soul, and spirit than it is not. And it's just really that simple. And so... As we think about this, as people already have eternity in their hearts, I think it'll be helpful if I just give you five quick examples about biblical stories that we can see where Jesus actually did this. And so the first one that I want to talk to you about is a Samaritan woman. And so we find that story in John chapter four. And so Jesus is going from Galilee to Judea and he has to pass through Samaria. Well, nobody likes the Samaritans. They're a mixture of Jews and Gentiles. And sometimes in their culture, they're considered at the same level as dogs, which is not a good thing. And so Jesus is resting by a well. A woman comes up to grab some water and Jesus actually asked her for water. And so he violated every cultural norm. He did all of the things that you shouldn't do. And in the middle of all of that, he ministers to her through that interaction and and he reveals himself to her as a Messiah. So he's hanging out at the well. He adds value to her and he reveals himself as a Messiah. Now here's what happens. She accidentally became an evangelist. She didn't have a Bible. She didn't know all of the scriptures. She didn't uh, know about sin and not, not to sin. She didn't have the Romans road into salvation. Here's what she did. She went off and she told others what had happened to, to her and she invited them to come and know him. <laughs> Are you kidding me? And many Samaritans believed that's the strategy. What about is if you're walking slowly through the crowd, you're You're ministering to people in a way that you're fully alive and fully available and fully present with them, that that you're adding value to them. You're asking Jesus what he's already doing. And then when you have an opportunity, you say, this is what happened to me. Do you want to meet the man who did this? That's what she did. And many Samaritans at the end of all of this believed The next story, again, we're going to just hit these really quick, just some highlights. The next story I want to talk to you about when when they went fishing was in John chapter 9, if you want to look at that later. The blind man receives sight. So here's here's what's happening again. Again, Jesus is walking slowly among the crowd. He sees a blind man who was blind since birth. Jesus spits on the ground. He makes some mud. He rubs it in the person's eye, in the blind man's eye. He tells him to go and wash in the pool. And the guy came back and he could see. Are you kidding? 
Those who knew him were shocked. They asked him twice, what happened? And he told them two times, this guy named Jesus spits in the mud, makes this concoction, puts it in my eye. I go wash in the pool like he told me to do. And now I can see there was no Bible. There was no gospel track. He just said this, look, I used to be blind, but now I can see. Now my life is different because of Jesus. And so I want to ask you, how's your life different because of Jesus? And could you share that with others? As you walk slowly among the crowd, as you add value to people, as you're fully alive and fully present, as you ask Jesus, what is he already doing in their life? Could you possibly go fish in every environment that you're in? Another one is found in Acts chapter nine. There's somebody named Tabitha. And so Peter is traveling and there was a woman who was always doing good. She was helping the poor. So everybody knew her. They loved her because she actually helped the poor and she died. And so they called for Peter and they asked Peter to go. And he, as he went in and she's dead, he took her by the hand and he helped her to her feet. But what happened? This became known all over. This woman that everybody loved because she was good at helping the poor and she was nice because she used her life to make to make herself known because she helped others. She died. Peter goes through. He grabs her by the hand. He stood her to the feet and then everybody knew it became known all over. And here's the key. Many became or many came to know Jesus. Many became followers of Jesus. Paul in Athens, in Acts chapter 17, he's going through a pagan city. Again, he became whatever he needed to become to people so that they could see the Christ. There were idols everywhere. There were so many idols. There was even an idol to an unknown God. And Paul uh, went and he said, you know, this unknown God, this unknown God is Jesus. And people became followers of Jesus. He didn't tell them to come into the church or into the synagogue. He went out among the people and people came to know Jesus. He didn't tell them to come in. He went out. And again, finally, the last one that I want to talk to you about is Peter in Acts chapter two. After Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came upon the believers who were waiting what Jesus had told them to do when Jesus ascended, go and wait. And the the Holy Spirit came upon them and the town came around and they were looking and they wanted to know what in the world was going on. And Peter took the time and the opportunity to tell them about Christ. Do you know this Jesus that you just crucified? Well, he was actually the son of God and you need to repent. And do you know that 3,000 people came to know Christ? And so here's what I want for you is I want you to be able to do what you're called to do. All of us are called to advance the gospel of the kingdom. The world is taken and it's twisted. Evangelism and televangelists. And we're not necessarily trusted. And so we need to become trustworthy. Without an agenda, we need to be different. Without an agenda, we need to be out of the world, not in the world. But we need to be with people that are in the world because literally their souls, whether they spend eternity with Christ or they spend eternity in hell is dependent upon it. Whether they live a life that will make a difference here on planet earth or whether that life is truly vanity, it actually really, really, really matters. And so I want to encourage you. Now it's up to you. The baton has been passed to you and I in every environment that you go on, you are on mission. And I want to challenge you to go fish. What about if from this day forward, you did those three steps, those three practical steps that you would go into an environment and you would seek out people and you would walk slowly among the crowd that you would connect with them through common ground that you wouldn't just be isolated in your bubble or in with people that were like you or or who knew Jesus that you would add value to them and give everything that you could to them and that you would pray and ask God what he's doing that's what I want to encourage you to do and I triple dog dare you to try that over this next day, over this next week, over this next month, and just see 
what happens as you become alive in him because you're doing what you've been called to do. You behold him, you become him, and you go fish and you repeat that day after day and your life will amount to something.